This subject was touched upon by last year's guest of honor, the detention, Paul Anderson. And he made it his, had he made it his central subject, I should find myself with no problem on my hands. But Paul's own subject was an appeal for a unitary approach to science fiction, in which philosophy, love, technology, poetry, and the elements of daily life all played important and roughly equal roles. Now, this is an ideal prescription for good science fiction, but it's a good prescription only because it is good for fiction as a whole. And indeed, no good fiction of any kind has ever been produced in any other way, and I feel safe in saying that none ever will. One-sided novels may be satire or allegory or key novels, that kind of novel where uh, you don't know what's going on until you discover that the character named Horace Mills Fitzcampbell is really Henry Luce. <laughs> but they're never complete novels, with rare exceptions, and they have about as much lasting power as a piece of Kleenex. This description fits most science fiction very well, alas. And Paul did a very thorough job of expanding upon it. But it seems to me that Paul's unitary principle also goes a long way toward explaining why popular or critical successes like 1984, Player Piano, Limbo, Brave New World, Star of the Unborn, and so on, never increase our audience or the prestige of our idiom. We have asked ourselves time and time again why this is to be. Uh, I think I have the answer, I am not sure. Many of these books turn on gimmicks which to us are old and stale. And usually, they handle those gimmicks clumsily and with varying degrees of naivete. Yet they command an audience and a respect which are much more skillful and experienced practitioners like Ike or Poole or Cliff Simak can't even get close to. Orwell had no reputation as a novelist. He had written only one, Keep the Aspidisper Flying, and it was dreadful, and everybody said it was dreadful. Wolf and Funagoot were virtually unknown. Nevertheless, these successes can be accounted for. Each of these outside authors can visibly be seen to be thinking about something. George Orwell was not simply pushing around the devices of that old plot about the future Asiatic-type despotism in hopes of finding an angle fresh enough to sell. He had something fundamental to say <clears throat> about one of the great philosophical problems of all time, the nature of the relationship between the individual and the state. And it is small wonder that people, particularly in our time, snatched up that book as though it were bred in a famine. It's of no importance that Orwell's futuristic devices looked a little seedy, and still look a little seedy to this room full of jaded specialists. What is important is that the proposition he set out to show us is perhaps the most important contribution by an artist to this problem since Sophocles wrote the Antigone and perhaps the first original such proposition since then. This proposition, which is the drive wheel of 1984, is only six words long. Think of that, six words. The purpose of power is power. Not wealth, not luxury, not fame, <clears throat> not a woman a day, and most certainly not the public welfare, but the naked enjoyment of power for its own sake. To most of the kinds of people who are attracted to politics, power is not a means to another end, but is in itself the greatest possible of all ends. This is a pretty blood-curdling notion, precisely because so much of history seems to support it, particularly recent history. But not only does it shock, it commands attention in a way that the rats and the torture machines in the very same chapter can't possibly do. I have one more example, and then I will pass on. Verpo asked very much the same sort of question. In his case, it read, personal immortality for what? In Star of the Unborn, you will recall, people didn't die. They were scientifically changed into a sort of vegetable organism and planted, so that in effect they lived forever, presuming, I suppose, somebody else watered them. But the process sometimes went awry and produced monstrosities. Since these were irreversible, they were just thrown away. The monstrosities had a tendency, too, to resemble whatever character defect a man had in his original life. A grasping man, for instance, might turn into a huge flopping hand and arm, and so on. You can see the possibilities. Here again, personal immortality in the flesh 
is an old science fiction subject, which I have written about myself, and so have you all. But the question of what is to be done with all those years seldom comes up. When it does, there is usually a little ritual about how wonderful it would be to have all those lifetimes to become expert in some subject or to pursue some gigantic project, outcomes which just might be probable for one person out of a thousand, or maybe even a hundred thousand. For the rest of us, the chances are much better that we would simply wither, like Tithonius, or vegetate mindly, mindlessly, <clears throat> like Verful's flowers, or become more and more single-mindedly and monstrous, monstrously the same kind of cripple or sinner that we were during our first 70 years. For Verful, who was a Catholic, it was perfectly obvious that the human psyche isn't built to take immortality of the flesh. To me, an agnostic, his conclusion seems 100% right. So now, we have Orwell talking about the problem of power, Fonagut about the problem of goals, Verful about the problem of time and mortality. All these books are about something. I submit to you, that very few science fiction stories, even the very best of them, are about anything. And that in this sense, they fail Pohl's unitary test in the worst possible way. For all their ingenuity of detail and their smoothness as exercises, they show no signs of thinking. And by that, I mean thinking about problems that mean something to everyone not just about whether or not a mash will stay lit in a situation of no gravity, which is a gimmick and nothing else. And what happens when a general reader, fascinated by Funagut or Verful or whoever, steps into our field for more of the same? He may very well notice that what he is now reading is more adroit in some ways, but that one gain isn't going to last him long. General readers and critics may be taken in temporarily by small ingenuities which are new to them, but only temporarily. That is not the kind of thing they admire in fiction, nor should they, nor are they seeking to have their sense of wonder stimulated. The genuine sense of wonder, which is a piece of standard equipment in the human brain, can get along very well on what is commonplace to the distractible. It does not need to be bludgeoned by an endless succession of concocted and visibly spurious marvels. Antimatter, galactic collisions, and numbers with long strings of zeros after them do have their fascination. But none of them is nearly as awe-inspiring as a five-year-old girl who happens to be yours. Now, I know that Science Fiction Times isn't going to award me any headlines for having come to the VitCon and come out foursquare in favor of fatherhood. All the same, it is true that wonders are many, but none so wonderful as man. Yet you may read several hundred science fiction stories a year without finding more than one which reflects any consciousness of this banal and ancient axiom. The writer or reader who still thinks that an exploding star is inherently more wonderful than the mind and heart of the man who wonders at it himself is going to run out of these peripheral wonders sooner or later. And then perhaps he will blame the readers or the writers or the editors of the benighted public we have seen this process going on a long time. What he is now seeking from fiction of all kinds, science fiction included, is not the sense of wonder, but the sense of conviction. The feeling that the story you are reading is about something that is worth your adult attention and that the author approached it in that light. Some few works of straight science fiction are as serious and as rewarding as anything their authors might have attempted outside our field. Childhood's End and More Than Human both pass my proposed test magnificently. But I have the awful feeling that many of us continue to read science fiction and to write it for no better reason than that it is comfortable and safe. No matter how, how outlandish it looks to outsiders, we grew up with it and we're used to it. And I think it manifestly impossible to write well about any subject that you regard as comfortable and safe, nor to read it well if comfort and safety are what you're seeking. Good science fiction is neither. And it's precisely the science fiction story that rattles people's teeth and shakes their convictions that finds its way into the mainstream. And this is the essence of the difference. And by this, I don't mean icon smashing. 
I personally feel quite certain that people will still be reading Ted Sturgeon on the variety and nature of the love relationship long after the advertising boys have wrought their final offense and gone home and are no longer there available to be satirized. Just as they still read the brothers Karamazov, but won't even open Uncle Tom's cabin, although they were written in the same year. Slavery is dead, but the problems that are discussed in the brothers are still with us, and they always will be. And we have reached the stage where our physical horizons can't be expanded much more without bursting the bubble of the physical universe. The ethical, the moral, the philosophical horizons remain. And those are infinite. It is there, I believe, that the realm of good science fiction must lie. Before his death, my dear friend Cyril Kornbluth had come to roughly the same conclusion. I quote, We are suspending reality, you and I. By the signs of the rocket ship and the ray gun and the time machine, we indicate that the relationship between us has nothing to do with the real world. By writing the stuff and by reading it, we abdicate from action. We give free play to our unconscious drives and symbols. We write and read not about the real world, but about ourselves and the things within ourselves. This is true, but it is not all of the truth. The real world is not different from what we have inside our skulls. In fact, all we know about the real world is inside our skulls. This dichotomy which Cyril describes is not a real dichotomy. The real insides of fiction is all in the head. And that's where it must go, otherwise it is just gadgetry and talk. Back at the Imperial Academy on Barzoom, my grizzled old speech teacher used to tell me that I must never leave an audience with a general point but must always provide them with some action they might take if they agreed with me. As it happens, I have one handy. The only place in our field, in fact, where any kind of influence can be exerted on what gets written, not what gets bought, mind you, but what gets written, is in the Google voting. Next year, when the magic time comes around, and you have made up your list of five or ten possibles in each category, and particularly in the novel, because this is where the influence gets made. I suggest that you put aside your other reasons for admiring your choices, just temporarily, and ask yourself about each title that you have put down. Is it about anything? Nothing could be better for the health of our field than to let every science fiction writer know, beginning right now, that from now on there will be no escape from this question.